So I'm going to turn things over now to our host for the evening. Carol Off, of course, is the host of everyone's favorite radio show. What's it called? As It Happens on Radio 1 on CBC. She, of course, has also worked as a television reporter and documentary maker for many years, during which time she covered the Bosnian War. She is the author of the best-selling book, The Lion, the Fox, and the Eagle, a story of generals and justice in Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and another national bestseller on the war in Croatia, The Ghosts of Medak Pocket, the story of Canada's secret civil war. Who better to conduct this panel than Carol Off? Thank you. Hello, good evening. Wow, this is an amazing crowd, and it's very... I should say it's, it's, it's enlightening and cheering to see people turn out to discuss war. I, that doesn't make sense, right? But it is, I think, testimony to the things that are going on right now and, and the vital current affairs, and we're going to discuss some of those tonight. But first of all, I'm going to introduce the panel, and uh, I'm going to start, actually, with the guy on the far left, Paul Heimbecker. I first learned about Paul Heimbecker when I was trying to find out why, Brian Mulroney's foreign policy was among the most forward-thinking and advanced of any of his time. And that seemed perplexing to me for some reason. <laughs> Until I learned that Paul Heimbecker was Brian Mul Mulroney's foreign policy. He is the man, he's the brains behind it, the ideas behind it, the speechwriter behind it. He went on from there, he was our ambassador to Germany during the Bosnian War, a very crucial and difficult time to be in that position, and I'm thinking he's going to speak to some of that tonight. He was also, among many other things, the UN ambassador, our ambassador to the United Nations, when we were on the Security Council. You recall that that was one time possible. <laughs> And he, was, he did something absolutely remarkable. He was part of the Canadian government uh, team that was able to establish something called responsibility to protect. And we cannot underestimate the, the power and the effect of that. He is now the director of the Center for Global Relations at Wilfrid Laurier University. And he's also at the Center for International Governance and Innovation. This is Paul Heimbecker. <laughs> Next to him, Janice Stein. When she came to give analysis in the CBC, the National, when I first met her, uh, it was during some very, very big stories. We were dealing with the war in Iraq, we were dealing with Afghanistan, and it was, I was there at the National at that time as a reporter. There were entire episodes of the National, an hour-long show, where a woman did not appear. It was extraordinary, and it was very alarming to many of us, um, including, luckily and happily, the programmers at CBC. They were so relieved to find Janice, a woman, that they could put there. Um, and then, but in a very short order, she was outshining everybody else on analysis and understanding of these wars. And from, I have to say, a woman's perspective, it's not an entirely, it's not a girl thing I'm talking about here. I think a lot of you understand what I'm saying, but she, she brought an insight to those events that was absolutely uh, just awesome. And uh, I, she actually, in the end, cleaned all their clocks. I mean, she was great. <laughs> and she's going to become one of the most important voices of politics, domestic and international. She's a Billsburg Professor of Conflict Management and Director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Warm welcome for Janice Stein, please. I met Margaret Macmillan for the first time tonight, but I've been reading her for many years. She is a phenomenal historian and an eloquent and graceful writer. If you have not read her books, you can buy them at the end of the evening, and you must read them. These are books that are more than history. They are books that reveal truths of the human condition in a way that few other historians have ever managed. She is a quote I want to read that she it describes history she says, history is our authority. It can vindicate us and judge us and damn those who oppose us. Her books include Paris 1919, Six Months That Changed the World, Nixon in China, Six Days That Changed the World, and The War That Ended Peace, which is the book I've just finished reading and which you are going to be reading after tonight. She is also the warden at St. Anthony's College and a professor of international history at the University of Oxford. Please welcome Margaret Macmillan.
Hello, all of you. <laughs> Mike checks here. Paul, how, hello, Paul. Hello. Again, hello. Hello. OK, there you go. <laughs> Janice. Hello, Carol. <laughs> Good. Margaret. Hello. Good. Great. Um, you've seen the subject matter we're dealing with tonight. It's extremely broad ranging when you're dealing with the legacy of World War I and the siege of Sarajevo. We, we, we talked about this sort of through email about, oh my gosh, where do you begin? But it, there is an arc, and the arc is Sarajevo to Sarajevo. And uh, there are many things we can compare, even though one, they're just wildly different in their consequences and, uh, and their effects and the numbers of, of course, casualties in these wars. But if we go to June of 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand assassinated in Sarajevo. And then we look at April 1992, two young women shot dead on the streets of Sarajevo, which is the first casualties of the siege of Sarajevo. And what I want to begin with is how do gestures like that, comparatively small gestures, how do they, how did in these cases become such cataclysmic events? I mean, what was this, how was the stage set? How was it possible? And I, perhaps we can start with the, 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 the Great War. Well, I think Sarajevo was one of those, in some ways, wonderful cities which have more or less gone in so much of Europe, where you had different cultures, different religions, different languages meeting. It was a city where you would have mosques, you'd have Catholic churches, you'd have Orthodox churches, you had people speaking different languages, which made it wonderful and, and stimulating and fascinating, but also made it potentially very dangerous, especially once you began to get competing nationalisms and Sarajevo was part of Bosnia, which Austria-Hungary had annexed, much to the fury of the Serbs uh, in Serbia, who felt that it was properly part of Serbia. And so it was a, a place with great potential for trouble. And so one event happening there had the potential to draw in outside powers, to spark something. And that's what happened on June the 28th, 1914. The heir to the Austrian throne was assassinated in Sarajevo. He had chosen the worst possible day to be there because it was the day, the great Serbian National Day, the day they commemorated their great defeat at the Battle of Kosovo in 1389. His assassination in itself needn't have sparked a war, but it was the reaction to the assassination. But Sarajevo, I think, was both a fascinating and wonderful place, but a very dangerous place as well. You've written, though, that it was a war that could have been avoided right up to the very yeah. last moment. I, it could have been. I think, I don't believe that many things in history are inevitable. And I think we tend to think the First World War had to break out because there were so many possible reasons why it might have broken out. But just because there are lots of reasons you're going to have a war doesn't mean it has to happen. We had lots of reasons to have a war in the Cold War. And in the end, it didn't happen for various other reasons we can get into. But I think war could have been avoided. What really happened in the five weeks from June the 28th to the date when Britain went into the war on August the 4th, when it was a general European and then World War, I think was you had people making mistakes and people not strong enough to stand up to their military who kept on saying, we have to go now, we have to go now. I think the story of those five weeks um, is really a story of human error, failure to negotiate, failure to compromise. I just want to ask you one more question because I think it'll tie into what, when we go into other things, is that one of the things you've written about is the utter failure of leadership at the time. That just the brain trust at that moment was yeah. not stellar. Yeah. Well, there were some very bright people, but what, if I want to be unkind, I think the fact that three of the monarchies were ruled by inadequate people is the best argument you can have against the hereditary principle. Um, <laughs> I really think, I mean, the, the, the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, was a very nice man who could have run a nice small shop in a small village, um, probably getting it into debt and make, you know, missing things, and his stock would have got out of date, but he would have muddled through. And he was a nice family man, so his family would have been happy. Um, Wilhelm II of Germany was this wildly complicated character, always feeling himself to be inadequate and therefore overreacting by being bold and blustering. And Franz, Francis Joseph of, of Austria was very old, um, very isolated. He'd lost his heir. He'd lost his son had committed suicide. His, his nephew had, had been shot in Sarajevo. His wife had been assassinated. He was old. He was sick. He'd been so sick in the spring of 1914 that people had thought he was going to die. And so you have these people who really were not up to the job, were not strong enough to resist the pressures, but unfortunately had a great deal of power. I mean, they really mattered. Uh, and Paul, we, we have the advantage here of somebody who was actually had on the front lines of a war when the siege of Sarajevo began. And when the you front were, lines of the diplomacy. Of uh, the diplomacy, and <laughs> yes. <laughs> Important distinction. 
You were able, though, to see how the decisions were made and how confusing these moments can be. And they were confusing. Um, people did not know who the good guys were, even in Yugoslavia. As that, that country collapsed and fragmented, there were, then there was this, these two women shot dead, the Croat and a, a Muslim woman in the streets of Sarajevo catapulting Sarajevo into the siege and other incidents that catapulted the entire region into war. What did you observe at that time about how confusing it was? Yeah, one of the things I'd like to say, I think, is that uh, it's, when you go from Sarajevo to Sarajevo, you realize that we've learned something. We didn't go to a generalized war involving uh, the Russians and the Soviet Union and everybody else. Uh, we did actually, I don't think we managed it to the satisfaction of any Bosnians, but we certainly sat, didn't create World War III out of it, which would have been a, which would have been a parallel. Uh, the business about knowing what to do, uh, frankly, I, I think I'm glad that I hadn't read your book uh, <laughs> at the time, because it was, it was a lot more complicated than I had imagined it to be. Um, I, the Serbs were, uh, and the Russians, at the time I accused the Russians of being willing to fight to the last Serb. Uh, and, and, but when I, when I read the book and, and went into it more deeply, I could see that there was a very strong connection between the, and, and between the Serbs and, and, the, and the Russians. And we didn't, uh, I th we had something called the contact group. I think this is an important, uh, this is an important um, difference. Uh, there, there would not have been, there was no contact group of, of, the, of the same kind uh, in the First World War. But during, uh, during uh, the Bosnian War, and indeed the Kosovo War, there was a contact group. There were diplomats from these countries who met constantly and their job was to be basically to be damping down uh, the fervor of, of going to war. The other thing I thought I, I noticed in reading the book was that there was so much um, appetite for war. People were disposed to war, I thought, whereas in, uh, in 1989, people were not disposed to go to war. The, the, the instinct was otherwise to the point that the Bosnians were effectively being sacrificed by everybody else. And, I, and you know, there's a, an important stage where they're trying to establish their identity and their, and their independence. And basically, the world is telling them that it doesn't want them to do that, and it doesn't want to help them. Um, we had, uh, I, I guess, if you talk about you know, how did we make our decisions, uh, as best we could, I guess, is the answer. Uh, Mulroney was much more keen on participating, on doing something, than Kretzian was, for example, much more. Part of that was because we forget that Brian Mulroney's wife was a Bosnian Serb. He understood what was going on, I think, much better than other people. He had much less tolerance for Milosevic and Karadzic and Mladic than, uh, and, and the British and the French and the Germans basically wanted the problem to go away, and if it didn't go away, they were tending to side with the people that they sided with the last time. So it was not, it was, it was not a very edifying experience, but there was, not, there was an insufficient commitment on everybody's part actually to go to war. John, this from your point of view, the arc, Sarajevo to Sarajevo. Well, just building or, on or, what... Or pick up on a point well, that no, you... Uh, from Sarajevo to Sarajevo, what do we learn? Well, it, it, it's really fascinating because uh, if you go back and read the history of the histories of World War I, right, um, you see that arc change. So the book that probably everybody knew before Margaret's book uh, was Barbara Tuckman's book. And that was the story of this inexorable chain of events where people were dragged into war and it was looped together. And that actually was a book that fit, I think, the Cold War, where there was this deep worry about entanglements. The book that Margaret has so brilliantly written is actually a book about why people make a difference. And that book starts with uh, an individual act of terror, frankly an act of assassination. 
that's the book for us now in the world that we live in, which is such a different world than that 1914 to 1989 world. And it actually uh, connects very directly to Sarajevo. It connects directly to Sarajevo because for two, I think, very important reasons. One, because of the nationalisms that were free to shoot up once the empires pulled back. Um, and so you had to end the empire before that story could start. It was a horrible story, but it only could flourish once those that tightly coupled alliance structure began to break apart. But there's a second reason, and Paul just referred to it. Um, we learned about war. We learned about the horrors of war from 1914 to 1919, and then again from 1939 to 1945. So the big powers understood very well they didn't want to go to war with each other. But who paid the price? The small powers, the small peoples, the small nationalities who fiercely nationalistic, but the overwhelming interest is, in fact, to protect the, 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 the bigger ones from entangling, from coupling with each other in a violent fight. And so you have a siege that goes on for three years. And that's perfectly all right in a deep sense uh, with the big powers. And we see it again right now in the world in which we're living today. It's perfectly all right to have 150,000 dead in Syria as long as the big powers don't get entangled uh, and don't risk real violence and war. That's a sobering legacy. That's a sobering, that's a sobering lesson to learn from history. The, the two things, the, the breakup of empire, it, which was what happened with World War I, among many other horrible things at World War I, but the, the, break, the breakdown of empire, the blowing apart, the, the, the reemergence of all these small nations and these nationalities, the breakup of Yugoslavia and the, the unleashing of all those nationalist forces. What, can you all talk a, a bit about what got unleashed from that? What was, what was the force? What was the power of the force of those things that were unleashed when those, when those empires and that, and that union broke up? Yeah, please. Well, I think one of the most powerful forces in the late 19th and 20th centuries was nationalism. And the trouble with nationalism, it's in some ways a great romantic cause. It's about bringing peoples together. And so you had Italian nationalism, you had German nationalism saying, we must all be together in this nation and then we will be complete. But the very dangerous thing about nationalism is that it defines itself against others. And so it says that we're in this magic circle. We are the Serbian speakers or we're the Polish Catholics or whatever. And you others who aren't, who don't speak the same language or don't share the same religion or don't perhaps share the same cultural values are out. And given the way history had distributed peoples throughout the center of Europe, there were no neat boxes of Poles or Serbs or Croats. They were all mixed up. And if you see a, a nationalities map of the old Austro-Hungarian Empire before the First World War, it looks like a kaleidoscope with bits of green, bits of blue, bits of this. And you'd have a Hungarian village next to a Czech village next to a German-speaking village. And so once nationalism gets a grip, and, and it is one of these enormously powerful emotions, like. You know, who would have thought we'd be seeing religious ideology or religiously inspired ideology in the 21st century? But these things are very powerful and people are prepared to die for them, often in very unreasoning ways. And they, they, the danger is that they will begin to turn on their neighbors. And you also get, I think, leaders who will use it. I mean, we saw it with Milosevic. Milosevic had been a communist all his life. And suddenly communism vanished, leaving nothing for him to do. Um, did he want to stay in power? Well, yes, that he did want to do, and so he suddenly discovered nationalism. I mean, he went off to the Battle of Kosovo's commemoration in 1988 and suddenly discovered that, you know, he cared a lot about this battle, which I don't suppose he'd ever said two words about. I mean, Paul would know better than me before. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of wickedness here where people will use these emotions and stir them up. I and mean, we're seeing it not so far from here. I mean, I, I think mm. some of what the PQ has been doing is absolutely disgraceful. I and mean, Pauline Marois has been trying to stir up a hatred and a resentment of those who are perfectly good members of Quebec society by somehow defining them as other. And so I think nationalism it was already causing trouble before the First World War, but what happened, of course, with the dis disappearance of empires like Austria-Hungary, the collapse of the Russian Empire, the, then the disappearance of the Ottoman Empire, was you got these different nationalities scrambling to grab land. It was an opportunity. The gates had opened. Um, it was like 1989. It was like the end of the Cold War. You knew you didn't have much time to grab what you wanted. And so you got, Winston Churchill called them, the wars of the pygmies succeeded the First World War. You got a whole series of little wars all over Europe about grabbing land. And, 
history came in, everybody rummaged through history and said, well, this was ours in the 13th century, we must have it back again. And, you know, human nature being what it is, there was no nationality that said, you know, we'd really like to settle for a little country the size of Switzerland. Who wants a big country? I mean, no, they went the other way around. I mean, imagine what the Italians could do um, and did, or the Greeks, you know, empires, you know, classical empires suddenly could be resurrected. Nationalism, Paul? Nationalism. One of the things that I, it's in the nature of the discussion we're having that we're going from Sarajevo to Sarajevo, but we kind of, we better not, as Janice said, forget what happened in, in between. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think we, uh, we learned, I don't think we did learn the lesson of Sarajevo in 1914 until about 1945. But then I think we did learn it. It's not that we can't make progress and that people can't learn, they can. They sometimes forget, but they can learn. We, the greatest generation, uh, my parents' generation, brought about the uh, UN Charter. The, and the UN treaties, there, there are about 500 treaties con, you know, concluded under UN auspices. And these are basically the rules of the road. These are the ways most countries accept that the world will be governed. They see it as in their interest to observe, generally speaking, those, those rules. And, as, and you were right, it's the big powers, the five permanent members of the Security Council in particular, still regarded as the big powers, certainly the United States, Russia, who uh, have, you know, see in the UN and in the way it functions a way of not going to war with each other. And one of the things which was, uh, s s struck me uh, in the um, discussion of Crimea was the immediate reference to, uh, to the Sudetenland and to the German invasion. And the lesson of the Sudetenland was you had to stop the Germans before they got started. Do you want to name the person who raised the Sudetenland? Uh, well, there was, uh, Hillary Clinton was one. I think Mr. Baird was another, Mr. Mr. Harper, perhaps. Um, but the significance of it was that if you learn that lesson, it meant that you had to act militarily and stop the Russians. This is something we had been trying not to do. We had not gone to war in, since 1945 because 60 million people died, or 90 million, depending on how you count, the last time. And if we, if we start, you know, I guess I, what I'd say is talk is cheap. You start talking about stopping the Russians, it means that you've got to put your muscle where your mouth is. You've got to be prepared to go. One of the things that, uh, there's a wonderful cartoon I saw uh, the other day, and it showed the leader of the Canadian government declaring that uh, uh, he had just uh, ordered that the Canadian Navy be towed to the Black Sea <laughs> 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 to intervene there. <laughs> I think, oh, you know. One ship. <laughs> The one that wasn't punctured by the other one. <laughs> so I, I, I think that the, but the, the general point is, I think we, we have learned something. The, the difficulty is that we have to, the, the way to oppose the Russians who have some 19th century instincts is with 21st century instruments. And we don't know for sure if those are going to work or not. And by the way, uh, with Ukraine, I think we did absolutely the right thing in supporting them. I think what the Russians did was, of course, illegal, both the uh, referendum at gunpoint and, uh, and, and, and the annexation. But at the same time, uh, you know, this is a, uh, this is a game that we're in for the long term. It's, it's going to cost a great deal of money, ladies and gentlemen, your money, if we are going to do what it what we say we're going to do. It's a government that ranks 144th on the corruption list out of 170 something. Uh, it hasn't had a stable government. It's had, uh, back in the day, we were trying to give uh, landmine money. We were, to, uh, to the Ukrainians, we were you know, trying to help them get rid of their landmines. Uh, this was, in, uh, this was when, when Lloyd Axworthy was foreign minister. It took us several years to find somebody to give the money to who wasn't just going to keep it. Um, and that's actually the case. So um, I, I, I guess I, well, the point I'm coming to is that we've learned in between the UN Charter is part of the rules of the road. 
It does not, by the way, recognize spheres of influence, which is what the Russians keep talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, that they have an interest in Ukraine. They don't have an interest in Ukraine. They have concerns with Ukraine, but they don't have a legitimate recognized interest in Ukraine. Tannis, I want to get So you. just to, to change the motif a little bit, um, and to come back to, to Sarajevo, um, if you give me just a minute, Carol, yeah, to tell a story, um, because, um, Margaret's absolutely right. When em we know when empires break up, that's a bloody period. Uh, when, it, when any big empire breaks up, uh, people scramble for the spoils. Uh, and it, it happened when the Soviet Empire broke up. It happened after World War I. But Sarajevo was special um, in, in many ways. So to come back to Sarajevo just for a moment, um, it, it was this truly multicultural, multi-religious, um, actually quite wonderful city. Um, and why, what I, I happen to read a story, and it, it, it's an interesting story right now, because we are coming to Passover and to Easter. And there is a very, very famous Sarajevo Haggadah, which is the book that is used for Passover. And it's beautifully illuminated. 600-year-old manuscript, uh, which was in the Sarajevo Library. And it obviously had multiple lives, but let's just look at the two lives. First life was um, from 1941 to 1945, when the Germans and their fascist sympathizers ruled Sarajevo. Who saved, who took the Haggadah and hid it? Well, it was actually a Muslim who took it out of the Sarajevo library, refused to surrender it to the German commander, took it out of the city and hid it among, in a mosque among a collection of Qurans and kept it safe, really risking his own life to do this, and returned it to the city uh, only after the war was over. Uh, so even though the library in Sarajevo was damaged during the war, somehow, now that's an extraordinary act, in a time of war and division, uh, where really people's lives were polarized by this division, happened again in 92-95, during a siege when, again, the library was at risk. And this time, it was a Christian family uh, that was aware of the existence of this book and saved the book. So running through this whole history of Sarajevo where you see, on the one hand, and I guess this is what makes history so interesting and so contradictory, um, you see on the one hand this extraordinary legacy of multiculturalism and living together, which can burst apart. It, it, it's like a, a, almost you throw a match into a lit tinderbox, and all of a sudden people that were intermarried and did things for one another, all of a sudden they're you and me and they're other. Uh, but there's also these extraordinary acts. And I think that story is, could only happen actually in Sarajevo. There's actually another layer of complexity to that because the man who saved it the second time in 92, whom I, I know, um, he ran through a hail of bullets He's, yes. uh, to get it. He was a Muslim. The man who actually ran into the building under fire yeah. And, and got the, the Haggadah out and, uh, and saved it. It's, it's an extraordinary story. But what it comes, the, what, 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 when does that break down? Is it just because somebody starts to shoot somebody, as they, in both cases in Sarajevo? Or is it a complex of fears, which Margaret has mentioned? And I, think, I think there's one thing that we see again and again that breaks us apart. I call them ethnic entrepreneurs, yes. right? Yes. I actually believe you need leaders who play a religious card or an ethnic card. They do it for political advantage. They're skilled at it. They're usually- but Why does it work? The question is why does it, what, what does it appeal to? Is, is it, 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 because people are vulnerable. Yes. When they, yes. When it doesn't work unless they feel vulnerable. It, well, no, it, 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 it does work if you feel, t I think there are two factors. Uh, one, you have to have this attachment. Uh, and we all have multiple attachments, but when the situation becomes polarized, and Quebec is an example, Margaret, you're absolutely right. When the situation becomes polarized and these attachments 
to your own ethnicity, to your own language, to your own religion, they then become much more prominent in the way you think. And if a charismatic leader comes along and plays wedge politics and is skilled politically, that's when you get this breakdown. Paul, do you remember when the, a line that, we, that was said often in Bosnia, and I've actually heard it in Quebec as well, said, why should I be a minority in your mm -hmm. country when you can be a minority in mine? Exactly. Right. I, I actually, I, was, I received the delegation. Uh, the prime minister was too busy and too smart, I guess, to receive this. <laughs> I received the delegation of, uh, of Canadian Serbs from Montreal who were there to explain to us why it was impossible that the Serbs, the Bosnian Serbs could be a minority. This was, this was an inconceivable thing. And I said to them, where do you live? And they said, Montreal. And I said, what language do you speak? I mean, we're speaking English, right? And so you're a minority in Quebec. How has that hurt you especially? But that was, that was the kind of, they didn't want to hear that. that uh, two anecdotes, one, one anecdote and one comment. Um, when things were getting, starting to get a little tense in Canada and you were beginning to see young Canadians going over to fight on one side or another, uh, Mrs. Mulrooney can, had a lunch in which she got the, the leaders, the female leaders of the uh, Bosnian, uh, Croatian and Serbian communities together. And the idea was surely the women and surely uh, Canadians at that would be able to reach some sort of con agreement and would help at least to turn the temperature down in Canada a little bit. Um, and I was brought along because I was thought to be an expert on, I'm not sure what part of it was maybe. Because you were a man. Getting, out of, getting, out of the, getting into negotiations and getting out of trouble maybe. Uh, but the, the lunch broke down immediately. I mean, it, it wasn't five minutes before people were recalling the First World War, the Second World War. Nobody mentioned Kosovo Polya in 1349 or whatever it was, but it's, I'm surprised by that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was uh, uh, there's an urban, uh, part of it is ethnic and part of it is religious, but there's an urban-rural dimension to this too. Sarajevo was a very cosmopolitan right. city. The countryside was not. Istanbul is a very cosmopolitan city. The countryside is not. Montreal is a very cosmopolitan city. The countryside. The countryside is not. Toronto, I'll leave it up to you. I'm from Ottawa. <laughs> Fort Nation. <laughs> I just want to, to bring it to Margaret here because we are in danger of losing out on that crucial thing called World War II that happened between these two Sarajevos. Yeah, and right. this, 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 this issue of when, when a people feels, whether they're manipulated in their thinking uh, or in what, what they're played upon, but when they feel humiliated, when there's a thing where we, we've been humiliated, that we're misunderstood, when Milosevic stood in the field of black birds and said, no one will dare beat you again, when we, we heard the same things from, from Hitler, you know, that we, we have been humiliated in, by the First World War, we're not going to happen again. You're hearing it from Russia now? And, I'm, and you're hearing yeah. Vladimir Putin yeah. using the same language yeah. about Crimea. And it, I think it's a way of projecting onto a single factor everything that's wrong in your lives. I mean, it, Germany after the First World War was, was an unhappy society in many ways. It was, had an imperfect constitution. There were a lot of people who didn't accept the new Weimar Republic. It went through economic troubles, many of which were, were its own doing, actually, or the doing of, of its government. But the convenient explanation was it was all the fault of the Treaty of Versailles, or it was all the fault of the Jews, or it was all the fault of the liberals and the de social democrats. I mean, I think we tend to look for simple explanations. So if something goes wrong, we don't say, well, oh, we, we tend not to say, well, things are going wrong because of a number of things. We tend to say it must be someone's fault. You know, we tend to want to project it onto a thing or a person or a group. And I do think, again, I think the agency of these people who will use it, as, as Janice called them ethnic entrepreneurs, and you get the same things with religious entrepreneurs, you get people who will tell a very powerful story and they will use history. I mean, we all think of history as this safe thing that's sitting there in the past, and it's not. It's a very dangerous thing um, that can come and be brought into the present, and, and the stories that people can tell themselves. I mean, you began to see it in Serbia, in Yugoslavia, before, before the whole thing bust up when the, 
Now, Serbian Academy of Arts and Sciences produced this horrific report in the 1980s, which suddenly portrayed Serbia as always the victim, always being pushed around by Croats and, and, and the Bosnians. Bosnian Muslims were renegade Serbs who weren't being true to their own people, and the, and the Slovenes were you know, a bunch of lazy sort of you know, people eating cheese up in the north. Um, you know, but I think you, you get these very powerful stories, and I think in a funny way, the simpler the story is, the more it can appeal, because it seems to explain things. I mean, that was always the great attraction of Marxism. It seemed to explain where everything was going. It seemed to explain why your life was miserable. It seemed to explain that there was going to be a, a better future for you. I think history can be very, very dangerous. And what you begin to see when, when societies begin to, to drive apart is that you get these very, very particular histories, which are often a mix of half-truths and lies, but they're nevertheless very powerful. I mean, Serbian nationalist history, particularly in the 80s and, and 90s, was a history of Serbians being betrayed, Serbians always fighting on the front lines against the, the Muslim infidels. And you've got a similar Croatian history. The Croatians had always been betrayed. They'd always be, been true to Catholicism or whatever. Um, and you know, these things, unfortunately, in times of trouble, I think are, are very useful ways for people to explain things to themselves and very, very dangerous. And what we forget is the other sorts of histories. And I think this is where we need to keep remembering. I mean, you know, even Samuel Huntington had talked about clash of civilizations. I mean, what that has done is make it look as though it's always going to be that it's going to be Christianity against Islam. And what is so important is to remember all the times for much of history in which people live very happily next to each other. I mean, Janice's story. Um, but you know, you look at what happened with Jewish and Christian and Muslim art in Spain. Up until, up until the 15th century, where they learned from each other, they borrowed from each other, people lived perfectly happily with each other. We don't remember those times as much as we should. You know, it, it, it's interesting because, did you, was this your quote, Carol, in, in, when you wrote about Louise Arbour? I, I can't remember if it was Louise herself who told me, or I read it in your book. Um, but we said, we suffer from too much history, right? And in, in part, that's true. So the, the stories that we tell ourselves of how we're victims, and then we bear vi no responsibility for our actions, or we excuse almost anything that we do because we tell ourselves a story about how we were victimized. Uh, so we suffer both from too much history and from too little history. But history is not neutral. We ransack it for what we want, and that's very dangerous. I want to talk about institutions and how they fail and what and how they when they succeed and Paul has said that the reason why Yugoslavia didn't become something larger I mean we, we can look at Yugoslavia as being a failure of the international community or we can look at it as being a success of having it not created a larger war but at the same time what ended the siege of Sarajevo it wasn't diplomacy no nope. it was bombing what ended this the the war in Kosovo it was NATO acting without authority from the United Nations. Uh, these were the things that ended. The, what's happening in Syria? Uh, is that going to end without a military intervention? So what, when did the United Nations, and you were there, you had a front row seat, you were in the Security Council, has that institution not failed us? Yeah, I was the last Canadian ambassador on the UN Security Council, and I'm stating a fact, not a prediction. <laughs> Um, I think the, uh, the failure in Bosnia, the success in Bosnia was the failure in Bosnia also. You can, we certainly failed the people of Bosnia, uh, just like we are failing the people of Syria now. Uh, and, and the argument would be, uh, it's not one that I would make, the argument would be that uh, you know, in order to avoid a greater evil, We've settled for a smaller evil that's happening basically to somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's happening to the Syrians, it's happening to the, to the uh, or happened to the Bosnians. One of the things we, we learned in Kosovo, though, was that not to, not to let it happen again. It started up in Kosovo, and there was a Western reaction, a much stronger Western reaction, and there was a much stronger and a much more committed reaction. We had seen Milosevic, we had seen the story, we'd seen Miladic, we'd seen Karadzic, we'd seen that story before, and we weren't going to let it happen again. In uh, the responsibility to protect, uh, which we basically led the creation of, we Canada led the creation of. Do you, want to, do you want to explain that? Doctor? Yeah, the responsibility to protect uh, was born essentially out of the, out of, uh, uh, the um, um, Rwanda. 
No, the other, Ser, not Sarajevo, I want to say Sarajevo. The, the, Srebrenica. 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 Srebrenica and, and Rwanda. And Rwanda. Um, because the world had taken the view uh, after 1945 that the best way to avoid these cataclysmic conflicts was that not to interfere in the internal affairs of other states. States would not interfere in, the, in, in their neighbors' affairs, and that was a way that you would avoid conflict. And that, was, uh, that made a lot of sense when the conflicts were inter, interstate, when they were between one state and another state. Once the conflict started to become intrastate, when they were within states, and people were being slaughtered by their own governments, it became intolerable. And that's where we set up a commission, we Canada set up a commission to investigate the, the relationship between uh, uh, humanitarian protection and state sovereignty. Because the UN Charter proscribed intervention in the internal affairs of states. But if you didn't intervene, a lot of innocent people were going to die. And there was one wonderful picture from Bosnia which kind of captured the whole idea. And that was, it showed a, a UN soldier with his arm, blue helmet, a Serbian Chetnik uh, irregular kicking to death somebody lying on the ground, a Bosnian, and the UN is not intervening because the UN is neutral. There was a very strong feeling that the UN must remain, must maintain neutrality. You didn't condemn, uh, you didn't condemn one side or the other. You didn't call them as you saw them. You said, well, you know, everybody's, there's, everybody's a problem here and, you know, and we're just trying to we're just trying to make nice. Well, that was Lewis McKenzie's line, wasn't it? They're all serial killers. Doesn't They're all serial, serial killers. killers. And, and, and one of the things that the UN did as a consequence of that, uh, they, they realized that they had to pick sides, that not picking sides was effectively condemning whoever the underdog was to his, to his or her fate. That takes us, in my mind, to, to Libya. Uh, Libya was a case where uh, Gaddafi was at the gates of, uh, of Benghazi. There were... Uh, he, was, he was promising rivers of blood. Uh, his son was saying they will, they will take no prisoners. There was going to be a slaughter, and the international community did react and did stop uh, the invasion uh, then. There's, there's a, there is a subsequent uh, controversy over you know, what happened next. Uh, and I can tell you, having been on the Security Council, knowing that there was a Security Council resolution that had two parts, one was a no-fly zone. One was a protection of civilians uh, clause. I would have been quite comfortable in the UN Security Council defending NATO's action in Libya. I think the same, you know, the, the only difference between Libya and Syria, I think, I mean, there are more than one difference, but I mean, a, ma a significant difference is the American electoral calendar. If Syria had come first and Libya had come second, it might have been the other way around. Because the, America, the, the President of the United States, or, was, or at least Barack Obama, was running on a c campaign not, you know, to get out of Iraq and to get out of Afghanistan. And he was not going to get into Syria. So I'm going to disagree with our last ambassador. I'm to not this. actually finished yet. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can still disagree. But it was a good long speech to the Security Council, right? <laughs> Uh, so I actually think it's, 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 it, we're not at the point in the evening yet, as in the Security Council, where everything has been said. It just hasn't been said by everybody. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so let me say that I actually think the UN has failed, and I don't want to dress it up. It failed. Uh, it, who, who is the UN in this case? I, you know, that argument is made all the time, the UN is us. UN but is us. actually, I don't buy that argument because no, the UN, UN is... UN an is them or it's us? The UN is an institution that has procedures and decision-making bodies. And if it's so divided that it can't act, then it fails. So just to say it to us just gets, gets the UN off the hook, gets all the members off the hook. And it's failed repeatedly since the end of the Cold War. It failed the Bosnians. Uh, it failed, in fact, in Kosovo again, and it, there was military intervention. In Libya, w which uh, was the, which was, it, it did not actually, the, the resolution did not actually invoke the responsibility to protect, but it should have, but it did not. Uh, 
But there that, was a protection of civilian there was. mandate. It there was, was. That was what they were supposed to be doing. It but was that's a, not artic, what they it's did. It's Article 4. They did. But they protected not. civilians in this way. Why is it that the leader of the country, in this case Gaddafi, is able to make decisions which are resulting in the deaths of civilians, but he gets a free pass from interference because he's the leader? No, I don't think so. No, but the responsibility to protect it is not a recipe for regime change. And in fact, the UN resolution that was passed did not mandate regime change. So no, it that mandated highway could have been civilians yeah, in, and a no-fly zone. But that highway could have been interdicted, civilians could have been protected, and then a political process of whatever sort could have been allowed to take effect. It wasn't done. And in fact, if we want to understand Ukraine and Georgia, part of what happened is Russian fury at being betrayed, having authorized that resolution and not used its veto. The command, in fact, went way beyond any civilian protection mandate and I think permanently crippled the UN. So I don't agree with you, Paul, okay, that it's the US that, electoral calendar. I think Libya is a big part of why we have a three-year-old civil war going on in Syria, because Russia is determined never to be put in that spot again. Well, first of all, if the law prevents you from saving uh, people who are dying by the hundreds of thousands, no, the law's an ass. No, but that's, that's not what it did. It, it, it did first not mandate killing Secondly, if you, if you want a real-life example of what happens when you don't intervene, what happens when you didn't do what you did in, 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 uh, in Libya, what you were saying, wars end with bombings. They don't end necessarily. You don't drop diplomatic notes on people. Uh, if you want a real-life example, the real-life example is Syria. Syria was not intervened against. Syria had the same kind of, uh, same kind of uh, uh, what's, uh, you know, it's not, fascist it's not leader. Comparable. It's not comparable. It is very much comparable because the comparable part is this. We did not act on one and we acted on the other. And the Russians may have taken, they do take the view. Uh, even the Russians couldn't stand what Gaddafi was up to. But anybody who thinks that what the Russians are doing now is just because they were feel, felt somehow betrayed, uh, you know, the Russians are also protecting what's left of their interests in the world, and that's their interest in Syria. They haven't got very much. So that, you know, what they're doing and what they've done in Crimea, what they've done in, in Syria, with, you know, in blocking the UN. And by the way, I, I'm not finished with the argument about blocking the UN. Uh, <laughs> I may have a responsibility. Can I, can I get, I I may have a responsibility, responsibility to intervene. To intervene. Uh, <laughs> no, but, but, well, we could, we could spend all night arguing about Syria, but I think one of you mentioned earlier on the lesser evil, and sometimes I think that is one of the awful facts of human yeah. life, and it happens in civilian societies as well. When do you use force? When do you intervene? It, there's, there are no clear answers, but I think the trouble one of the Trump problems with Syria, it seems to me, is that which side w were we going to intervene on? Who were we protecting from whom? You know, the, the sides keep changing. Well, initially and, it was clear. Well, then it I'm became sure. unclear because well, we didn't intervene. I'm not sure that's, that is no, so clear. I, I mean, if I were much. a Syrian Christian that's right. mm -hmm. or, or an Alawite, mm -hmm. both of them significant minorities, or if I were a Kurd living in the north, I might well say to myself that however ghastly the Assad regime is, it's an awful lot better than what might come, and, and, and you know, a, a Muslim-dominated regime um, would not necessarily be good, would, would probably, and we can see it happening now. So I'm not sure there are clear answers. I mean, we can say the international community has failed Syria. I think Assad has failed Syria. I think we should not let him off the hook. Absolutely. And I think a number of the outside forces that are funding some of these fighters are failing Syria because what they're doing is prolonging a conflict. I'm not saying there's a very clear answer and a very clear end, but the more I see, I mean, I probably started out in the same position as you, saying Assad should go, he was a dreadful thing, but I'm looking at what's now happening, and I think dreadful as he was, I mean, you could, you, you know, what, what, you know what we're not good at, we're, we're good at sort of bringing about the fall of dictators, we're not very good at replacing them. I mean, if you look at what's happened to Iraq. Or Libya. Or Libya. Or Libya. You know, but we seem to forget about Iraq. I mean, every day, there are 20 people killed in a car bomb, 60 people killed. I mean, the, the, I forget how many Iraqi civilians have been killed since the, since the so-called end of the war. Is it 10,000? More. More. Far more. You know, and we, we, we've turned our attention somewhere else. You know, we sort of, went, well, we, 
we didn't go in, but the Americans and the British went into Iraq, yeah. you know, blew away Saddam Hussein, left a total mess, and then just pulled out. But I mean, that's the carelessness. Too. Yeah. We blew away Gaddafi, and there's, now no. there are and hundreds killed but, every but, month. But the, so the countries, if, okay, if I may, the countries which point, insisted on getting, r yeah. getting rid of, uh, of not putting boots on the ground in Libya was Russia. If you, if you want to, you know, I mean, one of the lessons of Libya, and there's two lessons to be drawn. Either we shouldn't have gotten involved mm -hmm. or we should have gotten more involved. Well, and I think that's the same thing now in Syria and, and so on. Okay, but, but I just want to come back but, to the United Nations. Come back to the United Nations. And uh, just, yeah. Margaret, and, and, and I guess to our theme as well, that it, as someone once said that uh, if, if the United Nations had existed in the 1930s, we'd all be speaking German now. <laughs> it and did just, exist. It was called the League yeah, of Nations. Yeah. Yeah. And I just wonder if, if the United Nations had existed in 1914, would it have been able to do anything to prevent World War I? Um, it, 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 what, what matters is the will of those individual players. And right. although there was not a United Nations or a League of Nations before 1914, there was something called the Concert of Europe, which was a more informal arrangement, which had lasted pretty well since 1815 and meant that whenever there was a crisis, the major powers came together and tried to dampen it down. Now, it was basically conservative in intent. Um, they didn't want revolution. They didn't want nationalism. But it did keep a piece of sorts. And, and the concert did sort of hold. And they did get used to consulting each other. And you did have conferences of ambassadors, which did actually settle a lot of problems. And so I think if there is a will, you can build the most wonderful institutions. I mean, it's like you, know, you think of all those dictatorships which write wonderful constitutions. Um, you know, the Soviet Union had, I think, something like eight constitutions which were the most advanced and progressive in the world. It didn't matter because no one had the will to make them work. So I think if you have the will among the powers, and what, what I fear always is, is human memory is, is fairly short. And, you know, we are now the generation, we're just the generation that remembers the end of the Second World War. But a lot of people have forgotten about that. And I think we, we need to remember just how easily you can get into situations that, that become unmanageable. And I think there's too much easy contempt for the UN. I mean, I think the UN is as good as its individual members. But I think there has not been enough attempt made. I mean, the United States has worked very hard to build a relationship with China. As far as I can see, they've more or less ignored Russia. I mean, Obama said we're going to have a reset button. Well, I mean, the words are cheap. Um, but I'm not sure the United States has handled Russia well since the end of the Cold War. It may be impossible to handle Russia, certainly now with Putin in charge. But I think we could have made a lot better effort. But you know, in the end, it matters what the powers want to do. And it matters that they're, they're, they have some ways of talking to each other. So whether it's called a United Nations, whether it's called a Concert of Europe, whether it's called a League of Nations, I'm not sure it matters that much. But I do think what matters is the will to actually talk and, and negotiate. Okay. I, I just, I'm just a second, I'm to, because in a moment, in about a minute, I'm going to give you okay. a chance to ask questions. So I'm going to ask one last, and there's a microphone here you need to line up at, please. Uh, but I'm going to ask one last question here generally. I'm going to actually turn it completely around the page because it's just something that um, occurred to me when I was reading Margaret's uh, most recent book, and I was trying to think that in 100 years, in 2114, the Margaret Macmillan of 20, it won't be you, I think, Margaret, no. but 20, 2114, what will be the book that will be dissecting 2014? What will, what will be the crisis? What will be the, the, how could they have missed it? How did they not have the leadership to prevent it? How could they have not seen this was going to happen? Why did they not have, the, have the, the brains and leadership to do it? And I'm wondering if the issue that they were taking apart is climate change yeah. Yeah. and the failure of us to deal yeah. with, it was not the forces of nationalism unleashed, but the forces of nature that was unleashed. Yeah, yeah the, yeah. the book title will be uh, uh, Who Changed the Climate? <laughs> Uh, because it will be, but look at this, we, what we're hearing now are the consequences, the cataclysmic effect that climate change is likely to have. No one can, and brave and, and smart people are trying to point that out as the world kind of says, world leaders say, no, we're not even going to do it. And Paul, I know you are in Kyoto, so this is an important thing that we, that we still cannot get we a handle on. We have a huge human capacity to ignore things that are inconvenient for us. And, you know, we can all see in our own lives how the climate has changed. Something like 90% of all the world scientists agree that it's changed, that something, the carbon emissions that we have collectively put into the atmosphere since the start of the Industrial Revolution have done something significant to our climate. 
But, you know, we, we still look in the short term. We still say, well, you know, maybe in 20 years they'll come up with a technological solution. I mean, I think the effects, you know, we talk about sort of, you know, giant things in space, reflectors. Um, Job, jobs and growth, that's, job, that's, and, that's and, the and, priority. And, will they, and with Margaret McMillan, 2114, is she writing about the fools that, that didn't prevent well, the wars and the, and, yeah. the, and the breakdown that... Uh, but if, in addition to climate change, which I think I agree yeah. with Paul um, and Margaret, the big story, I think, that we missed in the 20th century, and it, it will, I think, be, along with climate change, um, the biggest story of the 21st century is religion. We in this part of the world had a view that as we matured, <laughs> and our societies matured, we would become increasingly private in our religious beliefs, um, and increasingly secular, frankly. And that is a Western conceit. Uh, we missed what was happening in the rest of the world. And it's a very powerful force, and actually is more powerful when people are displaced by climate change, or when people experience poverty, or when they experience violence. So I think along with nature, is God and, and the way people understand God. Paul, what do you think Margaret Macmillan 20, 2114 is writing about the foolish failures of our time? I think uh, I'm an optimist. I think she's going to be writing about this time it's different. Uh, <laughs> uh, I hope you're right. Uh, all right, all right. This time, this, this time, it'll take a little bit longer. Uh, you know, it'll have to get a little bit warmer. But uh, I, I, I think, you know, you're seeing progress in China uh, you're seeing progress uh, in, in a number of developing countries. What about Canada? We're, we're seeing progress in a number of other countries. <laughs> we're not seeing much progress in Canada. I, I must say, I, you know, I, I, I should declare, I was the head of the delegation that negotiated the Kyoto Accord, so you know, yeah. you, 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 so you know what my biases are. You're disappointed. But, uh, Rest in peace. Yeah. Consecutive Canadian governments I can say that without the slightest hesitation. All failed the Canadian people on, on climate change. Yeah. Okay, the Liberals did not do what they should have done, and nor have the Conservatives. All right, question over here, please. Thank you. Uh, microphone on? Oh, there we yes. go. Thank yeah. you. Um, I was listening to uh, the news on CBC Radio this, this morning and was dismayed, although maybe I should have been surprised to hear that supposedly there's going to be yet another uh, referendum in the Ukraine, in the Donetsk area, in no. May, I think I heard. And no. No. I'm starting no. to think that there's absolutely nothing that's going to stop Russia from putting its arms around uh, the, the eastern, at, at a minimum, the eastern portion of the Ukraine where all the ethnic Russians live. Is that a, a valid way to see things? Or I, I hope I'm wrong, but what would you folks say? Well, so I, that's not correct, oh. uh, so that's encouraging. Uh, or it's not correct, at least for now. Yeah. There were 150 protesters who um, were asking for a referendum, but there's no decision for a referendum yet. Uh, I, I think it's very, very important as we think about what's happening in Ukraine uh, to separate fact from interpretation. The fact is that borders were violated illegally and unilaterally, and that's not acceptable. Through an illegitimate referendum, and that's not acceptable. Where the, the, uh, we diverge, and we, do, we always diverge when there's no evidence, we diverge in speculating about what Russia's motives are. And there are some very, very dark interpretations of what Putin's ambitions are, and there are some far more benign interpretations. So without taking time, because I see the long line behind you, I think we, it's very important as we craft strategy. This is a long process. We need to stay with the facts. We need to make clear that we think what has happened is illegitimate, that it is unacceptable, and that we will... Uh, accept it. Well, <laughs> unacceptable, right? <laughs> and that we are looking for a diplomatic process in which Russia engages, so that those who were forced to participate or were excluded from participating in a legal referendum have that opportunity. Uh, let's not go to a view yet for which we have no evidence that this is the first in a, in a, in a concerted attempt by Russia to reestablish its empire 
uh, up to the, the borders of the old Soviet Union. Okay, I'm going to go to the next question there. Hi. This is uh, mostly for Margaret. Um, in your wonderful book, you wrote that there are, that Nicholas II brought three beliefs to his reign. The Romanovs, the Orthodox Church, and Russia. What beliefs does Vladimir Putin bring to his reign? Well, probably something rather similar. Yeah. Um, certainly Russia. And he talks a lot about history. And he's taken a very direct personal interest in history. He's, he's you know, tried to promulgate a particular version of Russian history in the schools, which some of the teachers have resisted. But he's done a lot to try and argue that the schools must teach a sort of triumphalist view of Russian history. He said Stalin may have committed a few minor peccadilloes, but um, <laughs> you know, million of them. Was, was the right man for his times. Um, he has talked about Peter the Great and has, has sometimes said, my predecessor, Peter the Great. So I think he, has, he sees a very particular view of Russian history. It's about Russia's greatness. And my sense is that he identifies himself with Russia. Um, you know, this whole sort of rather embarrassing thing about his taking off his shirt and showing his muscles. Um, you know, but it seems to be about showing that Russia is strong and wrestling with a sort of, you know, doped up tiger with no teeth. I don't know if you saw those pictures. Um, you know, th this is sort of a way of sort of, I think, cl closely identifying himself. So, I suppose now what we have to do now is see if there's a little Tsarevich somewhere around, a little Putin, 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 Putin Novsky, um, who he will make a, you know, his heir. But, um, some, and he's even been, he's certainly been playing with orthodoxy. I mean, he's, he's you know, developed very strong relations with the Orthodox Church, which has benefited very much from this and has, has discovered religion. I'm not sure he goes to church that much, but he certainly talks about how orthodoxy is part of the Russian soul. Vladimir the Great. And, yes. and the, there's a, a more alarming discussion about Eurasian. Yeah. Um, and there's a group of people around him. And, and that's one of the things you look at. Who's advising the prime minister? Paul will tell you, and I will tell you, that's very important. Who's advising the president? He's actually surrounded now by a group of people who come out of the security services. And that's uh, not a, the best filter not many to yeah. interpret the world. Next question, please. Uh, um, my question is to Paul. Uh, hypothetically, how would you see Lester Pearson react, responding and reacting in the situation you were in, in the secure, as uh, Canada's ambassador to the UN? Because uh, Lester Pearson, Mike Pearson, was the only Canadian diplomat and possibly the only can Canadian uh, quote unquote politician to ever receive the Nobel Peace Prize. How would you, uh, from your experience in that position, how do you think he would have responded? To, w to which question? Uh, how do you think Mike Pearson would have responded to the situations that, uh, what, like uh, Yugoslavia and uh, Turkey and whatnot, uh, Yugoslavia, Libya and whatnot? Yeah. Uh, my first, the first bit of diplomatic training is uh, not to answer hypothetical questions. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not a diplomat anymore, I guess. Uh, um, Pearson, I, uh, Pearson would have tried to make, I think, the international system work. He would not have been a peacenik. He would have recognized that, you know, uh, based on his First World War and Second World War experience, you know, that wars happen, bad things happen, and that diplomacy uh, is necessary at the end of those things. I think he probably, uh, I, I think he probably would have been encouraged, in my own judgment, about the way the UN worked, uh, which brings me, of course, back to the question that you and I disagreed on, and that is, uh, the UN is essentially a building on First Avenue in New York with a secretariat whose secretary general is not a CEO, it's not a prime minister. Uh, he's got two powers. One is to put issues on the agenda of the, of the Security Council, and the second power is the bully pulpit in which you see Ban Ki-moon talking in every circumstance about how much it would be better if it were peaceful than not. Uh, it is a question of the will of the major powers. Uh, I think Pearson probably understood that as well as anybody. If you look at the, at the uh, you know, at the, at the uh, Suez operation, 
he was the one who was worried about what was going to happen with the, the French and the, and the British uh, uh, and the Israelis uh, who had become disaligned, if that's a word, uh, with the Americans and, and with American power. And he wanted to see this, uh, this anomaly or this division sort of healed. And that was partly why he could, you know, to, to get the, Ameri the, the British and the French and the Israelis sort of back out of, uh, out of Egypt and to get a, a, a military force in there. Uh, so I, I guess he would bring those kind of principles uh, to bear on the kinds of crises he was looking at. But I think that we have had some fairly successful uh, uh, diplomacy. Even now, you see, you see Kerry and, uh, and Lavrov talking constantly. Uh, certainly the Germans are involved in those kinds of discussions. I think the diplomacy is taking place. Whether that's enough at this, to stop uh, 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 Putin, uh, whether that's consistent, you know, whether it would only be con the, the, you can only stop Putin if if he doesn't want to recreate the Russian Empire. If he's bent on recreating the Russian Empire, diplomacy is not going to stop. Uh, thank you very much. There's a woman behind you with a question. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Ariel. As I understand it, the First World War was supposed to be the war to end all wars. Since that time, we have had ghastly, universal carnage, and that has persisted. At the present time, we are on the brink of a possible catastrophe that might involve nuclear weapons. I would like to ask you, please, what we, you and I, and Canada, can and should do on behalf of the children of the world to ensure they can have a livable future, to achieve that goal of a world without war? What can we do now? Every one of us. Thank you. Well, I won't say nothing because that would be discouraging. But you know, I think we're dealing with a basic flaw in the way the international order is set up. We're dealing with a basic design flaw, if you like, in human nature, that we tend to use violence, if necessary, to achieve our ends. And I think what we have to do is try and think of ways of containing it. But I don't think there's a single simple answer. I think we have to support international institutions. I think we have to recognize, my own view is, um, I don't take the absolute pacifist view that war is wrong in all circumstances. I think we accept in our own societies that occasionally police, um, we delegate them to use force to stop violence against us and against others. And I think we have to be prepared to support um, a strong military um, when necessary to intervene to prevent further war. So I can't give you a very clear answer because I don't think there is a very clear answer. I think. We have to be prepared to use many ways. We have to try and build strong institutions. We have to be prepared to, we have to, be prepared to pay. I mean, someone mentioned earlier on, if you want to build a strong international order, it isn't cheap. No. And you know, we're not prepared to put money into rebuilding shattered societies. We're not prepared much to put money into our own military. Um, we're not prepared to put support behind international institutions even sanctions against Russia, which was one way of, of trying to uh, make Russia more reasonable. I mean, Russia depends on its ability to export its oil and gas. It's about the only export Russia has that really brings it in any, any money. Um, but you know, the powers are not willing to really start cutting into that. Um, the British are very reluctant to do anything that will damage their, their central role as, as a place where Russians deposit lots of money. Um, you know, if sanctions would be very expensive for the British and, and people in Britain would have to tighten their belts. So I'm sorry, this isn't the sort of answer you want because I just, I think uh, building peace is a difficult and complicated and, and long process and we're dealing with a very messy and complicated world. Yeah, it's a long game uh, that we're playing. There's no uh, way we're going to get the Russians out of Crimea uh, just by saying that, uh, you know, what they've done is wrong. Uh, I think we have to think that. But what we have to do is change the, the leverage. The, the, the Russians have too much leverage on Western Europe. 
And uh, there is an opportunity here uh, by bringing gas and oil from, uh, from the Mediterranean, uh, f from the, from the uh, Balkans and from, or not, uh, sorry, Caucasus and so on. But it takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of time and there will be statesmanship required in trying to, in, in keeping that objective in mind and pursuing a strategy which changes that. At the same time, you've got to keep integrating the Russians because these, this, this economic integration is a double-edged sword. It may increase the leverage the Russians have on Europe, but it also increases the leverage Europe has on the Russians because that's where their money is coming from. So if, if, uh, if, if we can in integrate Russia further into the international economy, and at the same time, uh, we can reduce uh, you know, its leverage in that international economy, then I think we've got, a, we've got a shot at a peaceful future. I just wanted to say one optimistic thing. We have, uh, we have never been, we in Canada, and we in the world more generally, we've never been richer, we've never actually been safer. The number of, the number of conflicts is down dramatically. The lethality of the conflicts is down dramatically. Think for a second. Compare Juneau Beach, 1940, uh, whatever year, 44, and compare that with Afghanistan. We were in Afghanistan for 12 years and we had around 160 Death. deaths, casualties. We had more than that in the first morning on Juneau Beach. So we've never been richer, We've never been safer, we've never been healthier, we've never lived longer, we've never been better connected. We're living in, in some ways, a golden age so long as we don't blow it up. It sounds like 1914 to me. Yeah. <laughs> Let me add one quick word of reassurance. We're not on the verge of nuclear war. That's not on the table when we're talking about what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. So let's take that fear away from everybody in the room. That's not going to happen. But paradoxically, precisely because we're not on the edge of nuclear war, we've made war, those small wars, we've made those a lot easier for people to engage. And that's the paradox of our age. Thank you so much for your question. There's somebody behind you, I think, the, the, yes? Thank you. So my question is for Margaret, and that is that the idea of uh, Yugoslavia, of a pan-Slavic state, was first dreamt up in the late 19th century, right? And uh, it came from the idea all of a sudden that we weren't Croatians, we weren't Bosnians, we weren't Serbs, but instead we were Slavs. And when they for were first drafting the idea of this pie-in-the-sky country, how were they able to ignore the reality that any pan-Slavic state was going to be majority Russian and therefore a strong majority of Orthodox? Um, I think the Yugoslav idea was, was a subset of pan-Slavism. I'm, I'm not, I mean, I think pan-Slavism pan -Slavism was something that people talked a lot about. When it got right down to the nitty gritty, I'm not sure that Poles, for example, wanted to be part of a pan-Slavic world, which would, would be, you're right, dominated by Russian. Since Poles were Catholic, um, that would have been difficult. And I think even those who talked about pan-Slavism in Russia um, were doing it often for rhetorical reasons. And I'm not sure they really, I may be wrong, but I'm not sure they really envisaged a world in which all the South Slavs, um, the, the Croatians, Slovenes, um, Bosnians, and, and Serbs would have been part of a great pan-Slav union. I mean, I think it was, it was used as a sort of emotional idea and it was used in Russia to say, we must help our little brothers in Serbia. Um, but what I think was, was far more important, actually, was, was, was the things that went against the pan-Slavic idea. These were national and uh, local identities. And so you got um, Croatians feeling very strongly that they were some ways different from Serbians. Um, you know, it, it's one of these, these questions of identity are fascinating because it's how you define yourself. Do you define yourself as a South Slav or do you define yourself as a Croat a Catholic and a Serbian a member of an Orthodox church? And I think one of the real, the Yugoslav idea, I think, was actually a rather noble idea. The idea was to bring together all the people living in the south, in the Balkans, and in the southern part of the Austrian Empire. Where I think it went wrong when the state of Yugoslavia was actually founded is that those who went into it had very different ideas of what it meant. 
Um, the Croats went in because they didn't want to be independent in suddenly a small country in a very bewildering world, and I think the Slovenes did for the same reason um, as did the Macedonians and as, as did the Bosnians, I think, really didn't have much choice simply because of where they were. They went in thinking this would be a way of sort of building a federation which would make them safe. The Serbs tended to see it as Serbia extending its borders. And so you had right from the beginning of Yugoslavia a, a different perception of what Yugoslavia was. Was it all South Slavs together um, sharing in, in something common and, and still maintaining their local identities, or was it a Serbian-dominated state? And there were tensions which made the Yugoslavia almost ungovernable um, in the 1930s. I mean, they had to basically declare a sort of a state of emergency and get rid of the parliament because it was simply dysfunctional. And then, of course, you got in the Second World War, Yugoslavia breaking apart, and you got a civil war going on in Yugoslavia as much as you got resistance to the Germans. And so it was, it was a flawed concept from the beginning. They never were clear about what sort of state it was going to be. And I think that, in the end, was why it fell to pieces at the end of the 1980s. But it's a, it's a very interesting question how important pan-Slavism pan was. I'm not sure I can answer it for you, so maybe this is a future area for research for you. Wouldn't, wouldn't you love to have been in, I'd love to be in Professor McMillan's class. Yeah. <laughs> is that the course you want to sign up for? I think we've got time. Thank you very much for your question. We have time for just for this last question. It happens to be the last question. So I'd like to know, we've heard a lot tonight about how history has been used, whether it's been transmogrified into our, idea, our ideas of what we'd like history to be, or to perpetuate our own ideas of you know, victimhood or uh, how one group was hurt by another, and as well you know, with the First World War, uh, how our, our interpretation has changed over time from just after the First World War with the war guilt clause to the, to the, uh, to the Cold War era, whether it was a, sort of an inevitable slide or a series of unfortunate events. Uh, and I'd like to know, uh, especially from you, Professor McMillan, uh, whether you think uh, you know, history is always a product of our times and that even you know, your books may be influenced by uh, our current thinking uh, and our current ideas and whether it might change in the future. And so I just want to know, is history always a product of its time, or do you think there will be a point in time we'll be, when we'll, the ar archives will be open, these issues will have dissipated, and we'll be able to look back uh, uh, with, with clear eyes, or whether that the 14th century battle outside Co Kosovo is still going to be an issue centuries hence, and we're not going to be able to uh, put past our ethnic divisions or beliefs. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so, Professor McMillan? I'll be quick, um, which is difficult for me, but I, I will be. <laughs> um, no, but I think, I think there are two, kind, two things that happen with history. One is that gradually over time a consensus will emerge about, about the past, which doesn't mean we don't keep asking different questions, because we are affected by the present. I mean, you know, the example I always use was when I was at university, there was no women's history. And then guess what? In the 1970s, the women's movement, and suddenly women's history became very interesting. And so we keep on changing the questions and our, we ask the past, we change our perspectives. And that's a good thing. I mean, the past is not settled. I mean, we may have a sort of consensus. We, we've come to a sort of, con more or less a consensus on how the Second World War started. We will never come to a consensus on how the First World War started. That's okay. I mean, I think history is about argument. And I think one of the things that's very important to remember as we commemorate the outbreak of the First World War is that we are, we are, you know, we should be arguing about it. You know, we should not be trying to find a single settled version of the past. We should be arguing about it because these are important questions and sometimes you, you're not going to reach a consensus. I suspect that there will never be a consensus on the outbreak of the First World War because there's so many possible explanations and, and so many possible perspectives. No, it's just, just a really quick answer. It's, it's so interesting because I can think of two experiments that might answer your question. Um, Quebecers and Anglophones in the rest of Canada got together to try to write a history of Canada. And it's stunning. You know, on one side was French, on the other side was English. And if you read those pages, Carol remembers, if you read those pages, you would think they were totally different stories. They and were. You, and they were. Yeah. The same experiment was tried among Israelis and Palestinians. And the only thing I can tell you is it was worse. <laughs> There is no settled history. Paul, your last words? Uh, last do, you think, do, do you think that we know, do, is the story of Yugoslavia, the siege of Sarajevo, is that history, do we know what that story is? His, history is just one damn thing after another. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great way to end, thank you. Uh, here, these wonderful authors are going to be at the back signing their books. I encourage you to read all of them because they are, I've read them and they are really worth reading. 
wonderful books. And thank you all. You've been a great audience. Good night.